verse history. Then Job answered, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understood what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No. But he would give heed to me. There an upright person could reason with him, and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he is not there. Or backward, I cannot receive him. On the left, he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him.
What I came to realize is out of the 38 parables in the New Testament, Jesus uses 17 parables to talk about giving and possessions. Christ was very concerned with the right use of our resources for our neighbors, near and far. Now the passage read to you today from Mark's Gospel focuses on possessions and giving, but it is one that has often been misinterpreted because of its seemingly distressing message. It is one that has been used throughout history and even in modern days to suggest someone selling all of their entire possessions and leading a life of willing poverty. This passage has made pastors and Christians so uncomfortable that even false stories have been made up to lessen the radicalness of Jesus' message, making it more palatable. As such, I was moved to focus on this passage today in order to understand what Jesus was really trying to say about possessions and giving. The first important thing to note here is that despite often being subtitled as the rich man's parable, the only thing we really know about this man is that he had many possessions. Possessions don't always imply wealth. I know a pastor who was moving to a new congregation, and as such, the moving truck filled with all of his stuff was weighed. It was weighed and it weighed over four tons. He was shocked at how much all of his possessions weighed. But he was not rich by any standard of today. He did have a lot of possessions. It's also important, though, to recognize in this passage that this man is coming to Jesus and asking how he can inherit, notice the financial word, inherit eternal life. The text tells us that Jesus loved him. And as such, he calls him to willingly give up those possessions that were holding him back from following Christ. A man leaves with grief. Because he is not yet ready to answer Jesus' call by not placing his values in his possessions, but rather placing his trust in Jesus. Jesus turns this man's question to inherit eternal life into a call to follow him. In other words, Jesus points out that this man's focus was wrong. He was focused on the life to come not following Christ in this life. But the text shifts because Jesus notices again the uncomfortableness of this message for his disciples. So he begins sharing with them more about what he's trying to really get at here. To do so, he uses the hyperbole that I mentioned earlier in the children's sermon. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. What? Really? This is that uncomfortable aspect that has made many well-intentioned Christians and pastors alike misinterpret this passage. It is the phrase most often remembered from this entire passage, especially when political or radical ideologies are at hand in the interpretation. Some have interpreted this to mean giving up everything and going and living in a monastic community, or to be perpetual wanderers relying only on God and not themselves at all for all their physical having to do any work, but just relying completely on God. Now some of you may have heard it said, because it was actually used in church curriculum for many years, that Jesus here is referring to a door in Jerusalem's church of the Holy Central, known as the Eye of the Needle. But this would be impossible. 
possible because that church wasn't built until the 16th century. The point is that all of these interpretations were not what Jesus was trying to get at. What Jesus said would be impossible. You saw it with your own eyes. There's no way a camel would ever fit through the eye of a needle. Therefore, it's not supposed to be taken literally. Now, to really understand what Jesus is trying to say means first recognizing his shift again from the earlier phrase of eternal life to the current phrase, kingdom of God. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, the kingdom of God is not heaven. In fact, it is more about God's reign, or more simply, God's active involvement in creation and history. You see, it is Christ trying again to teach his disciples that the focus is on this world, not the world to come. He wanted their focus to be on following him and entering in God's kingdom in this life. However, as Jesus points out, humans entering into God's kingdom by their own means is impossible. But then Jesus makes the greatest point. With God, the impossible becomes possible. For when humans put their trust in God, all things are possible, including entering the kingdom of God in the here and now. In other words, Jesus was saying that those who are rich or have many possessions will have a difficult time putting their trust in God instead of the things that hinder their spiritual life, such as pride, lust, selfishness, personal ideologies, along with the objects and practices that pertain to them. When we put our values in worldly things rather than in God, our money and possessions will be geared towards fulfilling those values instead of our call to follow Christ. Now, I don't know, maybe some of you have seen this movie, but in the early 2000s there was a movie called Pay It Forward with Kevin Spacey and Helen Hunt. It was about a 7th grade teacher who challenged a 12-year-old boy to come up with an idea to change the world and then implement it. This boy, Trevor, creates this idea of paying it forward. He is going to do something for three people that they cannot do for themselves, and in turn, those three people are to pay it forward. By the end of this movie, Trevor can't see it, but his gifts to others have changed countless lives in amazing ways. You see, this boy answered the call and trusted that his work would be fruitful even if he was unable to see the outcome. When we Christians freely give of ourselves, our time, our talents, and treasures, God widens and blesses the circle of giving in ways that we could never anticipate. Because Christ reminds all of his disciples, for humans it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. This passage and movie remind me of how many people's lives are affected by this congregation's giving. Now, this week, I took the task of looking at the line item profit loss spreadsheet to discover some of God's amazing work being done right here in this building. Did you know that over 1,200 non-congregants walk through these doors every week? This church provides a meeting place for over 12 support groups. And about 43 talk classes occur every session. In addition to that, this church is used by musicians and other outside entities that support our community. Now, yes, these groups 
are charged nominal fees to help cover the cost. But what I learned from the secretary is that some AA groups and NA groups have not had that fee increased in many years because of the fact that they could not be able to. But this church's leadership and members have decided that it is more important to provide a building for those in need in our community than to worry about covering the cost. Now many pastors here, if only I could see the fruits of my labor, I'd give a little more. They lack, they express their lack of understanding in that line budget item that you receive every year in a congregational meeting. Knowing that is why I sort of went on this exploration, and I want to share more with you about it. First, of the total hours this church is used in a regular lease time, 92.5% is used by the community, which I would label as local missions. The other 7.5% is used primarily for worship, Christian education, and fellowship. Of the total budget, the cost of maintaining this heavily used building makes up about approximately 25%, while the cost for worship, Christian education, and fellowship makes up approximately another 25%. This means the remaining 50% goes primarily to outreach, pastoral care, and missions. Now keep in mind, these are approximations that consider how much of each staff person's time, including the pastors, goes to each category. It speaks a lot about the mission of this church when we look at it from this perspective. With God, all things are possible. God can widen the circles in ways we can never anticipate if we entrust our time, our talents, and treasures to God. Now let's go back to the Gospel of Mark and remind ourselves what Jesus was calling his disciples to do. Jesus called the man with many possessions and all of those who desire to be disciples to put aside their worldly things and follow him. Jesus proposes that to love God fully, it means placing all of our possessions at God's disposal, which means giving our time, talents, and treasure in loving service to our neighbors. <laughs> In a time of transition, it's often the time when we pull back from following Christ and trusting ourselves, our time, our talent, and treasures into God's work. But we also want to keep in mind that Jesus here is not proposing a double standard where some give while others don't. All followers are called to give their best in service to God. I would challenge us here today, myself included, to review what worldly things that might be holding us back from fully submitting to Christ's call on our lives. Perhaps it is our possessions, or perhaps it is our ideologies that lead us to support programs or groups that do not promote Christ's kingdom here on earth. Perhaps it is our fear that what we give will not go to good use or be appreciated. Jesus reminded us of our need to ask God for help in putting aside our pride, our fears, our selfishness, our ideologies, and anything that is hindering us from following Jesus. He is reminding us to put our trust in God. Because with God, even the impossible is 